We've been living with the pandemic for nine months now. It is time for us to take a look at where we are today. Stories of COVID-19, tonight on Call with the Prairie Duck. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Duck. Tonight's topic is COVID-19. The most common symptoms of COVID-19 <clears throat> include fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle aches, sore throat, and loss of sense of taste or smell. Headache, diarrhea, nausea, runny nose, and red eyes may also occur. This leads me to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. This is a true or false question. Testing is usually necessary to tell the difference between influenza and COVID-19. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with the Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanied photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about COVID pandemic as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. I'll be your Prairie Doc host tonight. I'm Dr. Andrew Ellsworth. Joining us in the studio is Dr. Clarissa Barnes with Avera Medical Group Hospitalists in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and remotely via Zoom is Dr. David Bassel, Vice President for Clinical Quality with Avera Medical Group. Welcome, Dave. Welcome, Clarissa. Cla Clarissa, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting us off and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So uh, I'm an internist. Uh, currently, I'm a practicing hospitalist down at Avera McKinnon. Uh, AKA COVID Central right now, <laughs> uh, as well as I have some other administrative duties. Sure, and, what, and so as a hospitalist, what do you do? So as a hospitalist, I take care of people when they come to the hospital. So I don't do any clinic anymore, though I've done that in the past. Uh, if you're sick enough to need the hospital, usually you go through the ER or you get directly admitted, and once you're on the floor, then you're usually cared for by a hospitalist if you're an adult. Sure, and where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Yankton. So I've, I've been in South Dakota a long time. <laughs> in medical school and residency? Yep, so I uh, went to, did medical school and residency actually both at Johns Hopkins. So my, I was here in South Dakota and then I went away for seven years to Baltimore before I came back. And then I lived in Yankton for a while and Pierre in a while and now I'm in Sioux Falls, so. It helps to know what you're missing and know that <laughs> where you wanna be in yes. the end, maybe, huh? Uh, David, tell us a little bit about yourself too, please, Dr. Bassel. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for having me, first and foremost. Uh, I actually grew up on a small family farm in Kansas, uh, considerably poorer dirt than what we have in this part of the <laughs> country. Uh, uh, I had an undergraduate degree in electrical and computer engineering and actually worked for a while as a project engineer for a petroleum company uh, before going back to medical school at the University of Kansas and then did a residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at University of Michigan uh, before uh, marrying a woman from Minnesota who pulled me back to Sioux Falls area and couldn't be happier here. Wonderful, good to have you. And what are some of your roles with Avera now? So I still see patients part of the time in primary care, both adults and children. Um, and then administratively, I do a lot of work on the quality side. So things like trying to make healthcare less expensive for all of us, trying to improve uh, the rates of say, colon cancer screenings and breast cancer screenings, diabetic control, things like that I, are my kind of day-to-day -day job. Since COVID started, I have been on the Vera Central Incident Command and have been pretty actively involved in uh, the rapidly changing world of uh, policies and procedures for COVID. And, you know, I really appreciate both of you coming to be on the show tonight because you guys are our front lines uh, right now. I mean, there's so many medical nurses and providers and staff that are on the front lines right now in across the state. But uh, so if you can represent them tonight and just share your stories and, and what you're seeing, um, that 
that's that's what we're going for tonight. We'll do our um, best. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, it's been nine months since we started having cases, and uh, cases are on the rise. Uh, Dr. Basil, can you tell us about some of the trends we're seeing in cases and hospitalizations? Yeah, there is, there is no doubt that uh, things continue to increase uh, at an escalating pace. So if you look at the timeline uh, over this nine-month period, we had an early peak in late April, uh, early part of May, and then things really kind of settled down. We went to about half of that peak and stayed pretty darn constant clear through the summer at a, at a relatively low level. But then about the first or second week of August, we started seeing things escalate. And, and our numbers of hospitalizations doubled during the month of August. Then they doubled again through the month of September. They doubled yet again in the month of October, and we're still on that trend to double yet again November if something doesn't change. And so you can see the graph there is just how uh, rapidly things increase through September and October and that we haven't seen that peak yet. The number of people hospitalized keeps going up. And you can see on the graph, the top is a vera total throughout the whole system. And then, and then granted, there's a lot of people in Sioux Falls, but there's a lot in all our hospitals. That's also another difference that we had early on back in April and May, almost all of the hospitalizations were coming from the Sioux Falls metro area, bigger po population density, so it spread quicker there first. And then through the summer, it just kind of quietly spread throughout the rest of our footprint throughout the rest of the state. And now, you know, we're seeing a lot more cases outside of the Sioux Falls area than we are within the Sioux Falls area, absolutely. You know, certainly testing more people doesn't make more people in the hospital, but also test more people doesn't just make more cases because uh, it also depends how many of those tests are positive. And unfortunately, our, our test positivity rate is increasing too. And if we could go to that graph as well, um, could you tell us a little bit about how that works and what we're looking at? Right, so that's maybe one of the biggest myths that I've heard out there is that uh, we've got more cases just because we're testing more people. And absolutely, we are testing more people. Um, you know, as the number of cases are increasing, we're trying to up our game on testing because that's how you, how you beat COVID is that you get enough people tested early enough, identify that they have uh, the disease, get them into isolation before they infect other people and then can also do contact tracing so that those people can also get isolated. So that is the, the number one tool to be able to get on top of this. So we need to do that additional testing. But if that additional testing was just testing lower risk people and wasn't actually, uh, wasn't actually seeing a higher number of cases, then we would expect that percent of cases that are positive to go down. The fact that we're both testing more people, but a higher percentage of those people that we are testing getting positive is what really tells us that yes, this pandemic is getting worse, not better. And then of course, like you said, the hospitalizations, that has nothing to do with how many people you test. If, if you're sick enough to be hospitalized, you're sick enough to be hospitalized, no matter how many people you do or don't test. So that's clear indication that that things are getting worse. So now that we have more patients in the hospital, people like Dr. Barnes need to take care of them. And so, Clarissa, what are some of the treatments we can use for patients hospitalized with COVID-19 uh, that, you know, thankfully for a long time we kept the curve flat, it's rising now, but we bought ourselves some time. What are some things we can do now that we didn't do before? We did buy ourselves some time. And in fact, I, I'm very grateful actually for that time that we got at the beginning because early on, I mean, we were, we were just learning. We had to learn more all the time. So certainly what we're doing now is not what we were doing uh, then. Uh, you know, the best data has come out about dexamethasone or steroids uh, in these people. It's helped with <clears throat> mortality and the sicker you are, the better it seems to help you. Uh, so we like dexamethasone. It's also the cheapest therapy we have. <laughs> um, we do still use remdesivir, so the antiviral, uh, which seems to be, you know, data-wise, we have proof that it probably makes your stay, you know, the illness actually shorter 
We don't know for sure that it helps mortality. There's sort of a trend towards mortality benefit, but we don't have that quite yet. It seems to help the most if you get it early on, when sort of you're in that early viral replication phase. Doesn't help so much if you get it, you know, two weeks in. Um, and then obviously Avera is participating in the trial for the antibody cocktail with Regeneron uh, right now, which also is a very early uh, sort of targeted treatment for people. Are we seeing much benefit from convalescent plasma? Are we using that where we're taking blood from someone that had it and recovered? And are we seeing a benefit from that at all? I mean, I, I think plasma is sort of a little bit of a, a mixed bag at this point, unfortunately. Um, but we, we, you know, we still we still use it for people. That there's a lot of sort of reasons why people can or can't get certain medications. So it is nice to have options uh, for people. Yeah. Are there some treatments we're not using anymore? Yeah, so we're not using hydroxychloroquine anymore. Um, data really hasn't borne out that that's helpful in terms of length of stay or mortality uh, for people. So that was something that was you know, early on championed by some people to potentially be beneficial, and it, it, it isn't. Um, I think there were some other antibody uses, like tocilumabad was an antibody that was used early on, and that stuff has really sort of been tightened down, where if you're not part of a study, they really don't recommend that you use that uh, in people in the hospital. Dave, do you have any other comments on that, on some of the treatments that we're using or no longer using? I would say one of the other things that uh, we've learned throughout this, and Clarissa could probably speak to this as much or more than I can as well, is some of the non-medication things that we've, do, that we've done over time have really changed as well. Early on, uh, we were afraid that a lot of these patients were going to respiratory status go downhill really quickly. And so we were putting them on ventilators or breathing machines really rapidly. And over time, we learned that once you got put on a ventilator, it was really, really hard to ever get you off again. And so we started doing anything we can to keep you off the ventilator and really let you struggle quite a bit before we would put you on one. And that seems to be a, a, a more effective and a lot of people we've been able to keep from from going down that route. And so there's some other things kind of, uh, you know, putting people on their stomach for a portion of the time, things like that, that we've learned that seem to be yeah. effective with COVID. Yeah, the fluids are, but are really very different too. I mean, early on, what we were doing with fluids, I mean, people were getting sort of sepsis dose, high dose fluids, and now we really we really don't do that. We've, we really determined they prefer to be drier. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, you're talking about when someone's in the hospital, we're not going to give them a lot of IV fluid. Right. All those bags of fluids that people get sometimes. Yeah. But for those at home, they should probably still be stay hydrated. Water, stay hydrated. <laughs> you, yes. you can't yes. overdo it at home like we, you know, we have the benefit of direct access to people's vascular system, which you, you don't have to worry about it if you're at home. Yeah. Yeah. Important. Important point. Um, this this uh, viewer says, please explain the COVID test that uses saliva rather than a nasal swab. How are the two tests different and is one more accurate than the other? Dave, would you uh, answer can, that one? Yeah, I think I can take that one. So there's a couple main types of COVID testing. There is what's called PCR tests, which are looking for the RNA from the virus. And then there's antigen tests that are looking for the proteins that are produced by the virus. And so the PCR is kind of the gold standard because you can detect that earlier in the course and at smaller levels. And so you can detect a lot milder cases and, and a lot earlier cases. The antigen tests um, usually show up a little bit later and so they're not generally thought to be as accurate, but there is a, there is a time that you can use those. So with a saliva test, that could be either actually, because you know the nasal test is just where you're getting the sample that you can either run via PCR or for the antigen test. The saliva test generally tends to be more the PCR one. Uh, we've looked at this a couple different times and the data still isn't clear on how, how close to accurate uh, the saliva is, because the saliva has a lot of other things in it. It tends to break down a little bit faster, and so it's only about 75% as accurate as the nose tests happen to be. And again, there may be a role for that in more of kind of the person that's more curious um, or, you know, who is uh, 
uh, contact that doesn't really have symptoms. So there's a possibility that there is a role for the saliva, but I don't think that it's going to take over by any stretch of the imagination because it isn't as accurate as, as the nasal test in general. We continue to evolve in our thinking and testing strategies overall. And that example, one of the other differences between the PCR and the antigen test is the PCR test can take a day, two, three days, whereas the antigen test, you can get a result back in 15 minutes. So is it better to have um, a 75% accurate test in 15 minutes or a 95% accurate test in two days? And so that's the trade-off in where we're constantly trying to uh, make up our minds about uh, what's the better strategy. Yeah. There's many people that are affected differently by COVID and some have mild cases and others have life-threatening or even fatal outcomes. Prairie Doc reporter Tori Burnt visited with a woman diagnosed with COVID and her daughter about how it affects the patient and her family. For everyone that believes that this is a hoax, it's not, it's very real and it's very scary. And I know my family thought they'd probably never see me alive again when they left in the ambulance in the airplane. And so we thank God that that didn't happen and that I'm home. After four negative COVID tests and weeks of wondering what was wrong, Sue finally tested positive for COVID-19. After being put on a ventilator, being airlifted to Sioux Falls and admitted into the ICU. So the doctor came in and talked to my husband and said, we need to do a bronchoscopy. We got to find out what's going on. By this time, I mean, I'm, I've got pneumonia everywhere in all parts of the lungs. And it was on that fifth one, the bronchoscopy, that they were able to finally find somewhere a positive COVID. The whole thing started October 7th, but it was the 16th before that diagnosis was made. At one point, Sue had five and a half liters of fluid taken out of her lungs. Think of how much fluid, I mean, she was basically drowning in her, you know, in the fluid. And so to hear that there was that much to even take off of her, that just kind of, you know. Following the positive COVID test, Sue had to go into isolation at the hospital. That was traumatic on my part, and I know it was traumatic for them too. The feeling of isolation and they explained to me that they could only come in to help me when I needed something. But they had a monitor at the end of my bed and if I'd push the bell, then somebody would come up on the monitor and talk. But it would take them a while to get in the room because they had to put all their garbage and all the packs and all the battery stuff and whatever else they all had on there. You know, there was one point that I finally just kind of threw up my arms and I said, is there anybody out there that's watching me, is there anybody anywhere, you know, and, and the nurses were really good. They'd come in and they'd hold my hand and, and talk to me a little bit, but they knew they could only stay in there so long too. After being released from the hospital on October 23rd, Avera's COVID task force sent home a COVID kit with Sue so they could monitor her while she was at home. They included a scale, a blood pressure cuff, an oximeter, and other supplies to help with the recovery. A nurse meets with Sue every day to discuss how everything is going. And we'll have that for a whole month. And then I have home oxygen. And when I'm sitting, my oxygen level stays pretty good. But when I get up to walk around, it drops quite a bit. So I have to have oxygen on when I'm up walking. And this disease is a strange bugger. We got a ways to go, but we've come a long, long, long way. So thank God for family, faith, and friends. It really helps get through a lot. Really important to wear masks. It's not a political thing. It shouldn't be a political thing. It's taking care of everyone. So please put the mask on. Um, you know, just to be mindful of people and to be kind. Wow, that's a, a very powerful story. Thanks for sharing, Sue. Uh, Clarissa, you know, you're seeing these people that are just brought to the hospital. I'm sure they're scared and there's, there's people at home that are scared. And, and what, what do you say to them? How do you, how do you help them through that? 
I mean, no, nobody comes to see me in the hospital because they want to. You know, nobody's in the hospital because they're having their best day. <laughs> they're always coming, you know, sort of sad and scared and they don't know what's going on. You know, and it's, it's hard, you know, you, you have to, and not only is this sort of a newer disease, oftentimes they're more alone than they would normally be. Their families, which they would, you know, see as a source of comfort, you know, can't be with them in the same way that they are in other diseases. And so we as the, you know, the staff, the physicians, the nurses, and the therapists have to try and become sort of their temporary surrogate family. You know, we have to spend more time just sitting with them, talking with them, asking them if they need things like, you know, newspaper, you know, things that maybe aren't necessarily medical, you know, spending more time, can I get you a drink while I'm in the room? Um, and being very clear about sort of what's going on. And then we spend a lot more time contacting their families, you know, when we're out of the room, a lot more time on the phone, um, trying to explain to their families what's going on um, to try and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um. It, it, an emailer asks, I'm eight weeks post COVID diagnosis. I'm still struggling with hamstring pain, arrived on day one and basically been with me since. I'm taking gabapentin at night or I can't get to sleep. Do you have any recommendations about what to do to wean myself off the medication? Um, and then the same emailer at, at us said that uh, week over week I've seen improvements, which is good, but this week I had a new symptom appear, blurred vision and headache. Um, the blurred vision was in and out for a day. Headache was managed with ibuprofen. I've heard about blue, blurred vision as a symptom. Do you have any advice for when I would need to escalate something like this and go to the doctor, advice of what to do? You know, so some of these patients that have, we call them long haulers yeah. sometimes, that have ongoing symptoms and they get better and they get worse. And, you know, we can't always even for sure say if this is from COVID or not. Um, what 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 do you say? <laughs> this to is that? the most frustrating thing about COVID for me is that you know in any other illness, a viral illness, we say okay you're sick and then you get better and then we feel like you're over it and we're done. COVID you know has these phases, right? You have this initial phase where the viral infection and then sometimes people end up in the hospital for that, sometimes not. Sometimes there's this sort of secondary part where it seems like something inflammatory is happening, maybe related to the immune system. We don't quite know where they end up even sicker than before and back in the hospital. You know, for people who aren't sick enough to be in the <clears throat> hospital, a lot of them, you know, after their initial viral phase, end up with these long-term symptoms, these sort of long haulers, where it's, you know, weeks, months sometimes of symptoms that come and go and can be different from one day to the next which really speaks to the idea that there's something happening with these people's immune system that we don't totally understand yet. Um, but I think, you know, in his case and in many cases, you know, the answer is close communication with your doctor, yeah. you know, making yeah. sure that they know if you have a new symptom, you should tell them, <laughs> yeah. you know, if the medicines aren't working, then you need to communicate with them because the, you're not going to be able to manage this all on your own. Uh, there's not going to be a manual somewhere for this where you're going to have to sort of take it day by day. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dave, an emailer asked, once you've had COVID-19, what are the chances you will get it again? How long is your immunity? That's actually a great question. And we're learning more about this all the time. Now, we think you've got pretty good uh, immunity for uh, at least three months and to the point to where the CDC recommendation is that if you have symptoms again within that three months after you're initially positive, we're not gonna retest you for COVID during that time period. But what we're gonna to have to learn is after that period, you know, we certainly now have people that are four, five, six, seven months out after that. Can you get reinfected or not? The answer is I think you probably can in certain cases. I think it's relatively rare. And we think that uh, if you do get reinfected, it's not likely to be nearly as severe the second time. And it's actually probably uh, more concerning that because you might be a lot less symptomatic the second time that you actually might spread it a little bit more if you get the second time. And so it is important, even though you've been infected before in the past, you still need to wear your mask and, and take precautions later on. The other part of that that you mentioned, a lot of times it's very hard to decide whether this is somebody who is a long hauler and just has kind of a uh, their symptoms showing back up again from their original infection as opposed to a new infection. And so that can be really difficult to figure out between those two. So bottom line, it's relatively rare to get reinfected. We think it can happen, so you still need to take precautions. Dave, I think from my understanding, your test can still be positive for a long time 
after you've recovered and are no longer contagious. Is that the case? Yeah, so early on, some of the recommendations were to try to test to show that you were no longer positive and, and weren't potentially infectious. What we learned was that after about 10 days in most cases, you're not going to be able to infect other people. You aren't contagious anymore. But we still might be able to find enough of that RNA that your test will be positive for weeks or even months afterwards. And so that's why we don't even test again anymore. And we just assume you're no longer infectious. For most cases, after 10 days, unless you're immunosuppressed, and then we'll go up to 20 days for it. So that leads into this person's question. Um, how long should a high-risk person wait to visit people who have had previously had COVID? And in general, that's probably going to be 10 days, maybe 20 if they were really sick with COVID. Yeah, if they were really sick with COVID, if the individual had active cancer, took immunosuppressive medication, some of those sorts of things that would, that would make it take them longer to clear it. But in most cases, yeah, if they are 10 days out, uh, we no longer put them in isolation and it should be safe to visit them. In fact, it's probably the safest person to visit at that point. Um, this person has our vomiting and diarrhea symptoms of COVID-19. Clarissa? Rarely. I mean, there are GI symptoms associated with COVID. There are people who've had only GI symptoms associated with COVID, but you're much more likely to have fevers and other sort of respiratory um, things with COVID. Yeah. But then again, sometimes it's, it's a headache and achiness some, and fatigue. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, from person to per person, it's a, a bad yeah. sore throat. I've had a number of young people that they just had a terrible bad sore throat, swore yeah. they had strep and it was COVID. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it really runs, runs the gamut. You know, talking about exposure risks, one person asks about going to a wedding and another person asks about, is it safe to ride in a car with a stranger for a couple hours, COVID wise? And another person asks, you know, about wearing masks and why does it protect someone else more, uh, more than it protects me? What would you say about some of these exposure risk questions? <sighs> I mean, safety is a is a hard term, you know, is it's it, you can't guarantee safety from COVID really in, in any situation. Right. Um, you're really just about mitigating and trying to decrease your risk as much as you can. And if you think about it, the longer you spend in close proximity with people without anything in between you and them, the higher your risk that they may, you know, pass on COVID if they had COVID when you were with them. So yeah, riding in a car with no face mask for a couple hours would be a high risk activity. <laughs> what if you have a mask on then? A mask would help, but it wouldn't be, you know, like, why well, I have no risk now, right? Because you're, you're in a same circulated area. I mean, it's the same sort of thing with restaurants, right? Like when you're, you're sitting around people in sort of circulating air, you know, those are higher risk uh, activities. Yeah, and if, so if you're at a restaurant, it's gonna be better outside Yeah. when the air is circulating even, yeah. even better, but there's still some risk still some and risk. it's going to get cold outside pretty <laughs> soon. That's true. It is South Dakota. <laughs> Dave, your thoughts on mitigating and decreasing risk from various activities? Yeah, so the wedding question is, is a very good one because we've had several instances across our footprint where a wedding has been what's called that super spreader event where we've had multiple people come down from the same wedding with COVID. And so that is one that I'd really be very careful and cautious about depending on, you know, is it an outdoor wedding? How much social distancing can you have? But we've had several instances where, where, where quite a few people at the same wedding have come down with COVID over the next week or week or so. Um, and it's just, it's, uh, your risk of contracting COVID is, is a, product of the length of time that you're exposed and then how much virus that individual is spreading at that that time. And so the longer you're around in any one episode and the more that somebody is is uh, exhaling that that virus, the, the worse of a chance you are that you're going to come down with it. And one of the reasons COVID is so bad is is inevitably uh, you're spreading the virus a couple of days before you get symptomatic. And so you don't know that uh, you're spreading it until it's too late. And once again, Clarissa, why are our masks protect others more than it protects me? Because it's really about sort of making sure that I, if I have COVID, I'm keeping, you know, you know, if you think about, 
I'm breathing, but I'm also potentially coughing or there's droplets or other sort of larger particles. And if I'm keeping them within my mask, then I'm decreasing the chance that I'm giving them to someone else. Yeah, and even if those virus particles are so tiny, 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 yeah. A lot of times they're in these respiratory droplets that can get caught yep. by these masks. Yeah, I mean, it's not that the virus itself is not is going to get caught by a cloth mask. It's really about sort of the things that they're living in getting caught. Yeah. Well, speaking of transmitting things to others, we're coming upon influenza season. And so health officials worry about the severity of both influenza and COVID-19. Prairie Doc reporter Carter Schmidt spoke with family physician Dr. Scott Boyens of Sanford Health, who recently just recovered from COVID-19. Well, they're both uh, caused by viruses. Uh, that's uh, pretty obvious. They're both respiratory illnesses that are transmitted by respiratory droplets and, uh, and uh, also touching surfaces um, and, and you know, coming to your mouth and things like that. Symptom-wise, uh, some of the similarities, you're talking cough, aches, sore throat, some GI symptoms, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, and the, the length of illness is, is similar, but there are some differences and some mild subtleties between the two, at least we think, going into this uh, season of having both out there. Well, the main difference is if I'm going to walk into a, a room, an uh, exam room, and think this patient has uh, influenza, one of the big differences you're going to see is that the illness started like a Mack truck. It, it was right now, where COVID seems to be a little bit more uh, indolent and a little little uh, slower to, to hit you. You know, the, the body aches associated with influenza are pretty profound. The cough, uh, is is really uh, uh, deep and harsh, and there's a lot of chest burning uh, when you have that influenza type cough. And some of that, I mean, people have those symptoms with COVID, but those are probably going to be more of the hospitalized patients where we don't uh, see them as often in the outpatient space. Well, beings are vo both viruses. We don't have any antibiotics. Those don't work against viruses. And, and so influenza has an antiviral medication that won't necessarily kill the virus, but it may reduce the severity or at least the length of time that you're ill by a little bit. And that can be done uh, with a pill as an outpatient. And so we'll be using probably a fair amount of that this year uh, and probably more so than we have in previous years. The treatment for COVID, again, a virus, has an antiviral, not necessarily approved, but used, not as an outpatient. We use that in the hospital. That's the, everyone's heard about remdesivir. And so that is a, as a hospital administered medication for some of the more severe patients. Take a lot of the, the dual infections away and, the, and the, some of the, uh, the difficulty in, in teasing out the diagnoses. You can get both at the same time. I've seen it happen across the country in different areas. Once again, please get your flu shot. Um, I, we have a question here, Dave, that I'd like to ask you. If a person is recovering at home with COVID, what should be your monitoring uh, re regimen? So it really depends on how severe of symptoms you have. And so uh, COVID can, can be dangerous in a couple different ways. Um, the most common is gonna be respiratory compromise. So pneumonia, uh, not being able to keep oxygen uh, throughout your tissues the way that you need to be. And so, a lot of our patients we actually send home with a finger O2 monitor so that they can monitor that at home if we're at all worried about them because that's one of the biggest things that we have to keep an eye on. Certainly like many viral illnesses, dehydration is always a concern, so making sure that you're still urinating as much as, as you certainly can. And then COVID is also seems like it can cause 
inflammation or swelling in a whole bunch of other areas as well. And so that's one of the problems with COVID is that it can present and be dangerous in a lot of different ways. So it can cause swelling in vessels and can cause clotting problems, pulmonary embolus, you know, blood clots in your lungs. It can cause blood, blood clots in your heart and increase your risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Um, it can cause uh, problems in your GI tract. So all of those, so anything outside of the normal um, that uh, is concerning, kind of like Clarissa said earlier, the key to this is staying in close contact uh, with your physician. So those patients that have more severe illness, we'll check in on them daily or even multiple times during the day. Some of them will check in electronically with so that we can have that video dialogue back and forth and monitor some of their vital signs that way. And so uh, this is this is a strange illness that can present multiple different ways. And so we try to keep a close eye on it. Yeah, don't be afraid to reach out to your doctor. And there's several monitoring programs that, that can help. Um, and, you know, we're a lot more comfortable with doing virtual visits, too, so you don't necessarily have to come in. You might be able to be, you know, in touch with your doctor uh, while still staying home. Um, this Facebook uh, viewer says they've heard about the risk of blood clots for people recovering at home uh, or with COVID, really. What do you think about blood clots with COVID, Clarissa? I don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> They're bad. Uh, no, I, it's true. I mean, we've seen weird things with this virus, things that you would never think to associate with something that seems more respiratory. Um, you know, I think we do see that the risk of clotting is higher in people with sort of more severe illness. Um, and there's certain sort of inflammatory markers that we can check that are associated with a higher risk of clotting. Those people tend to be in the hospital uh, because they're pretty sick. Uh, and then, you know, there's, there's different things we can do to sort of, you know, keep an eye on them in that way. But for most people at home with mild cases, they're, um, they're less likely. Um, but certainly if you have symptoms or you think you might have a blood clot, once again, call your doctor. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and that's a good example of maybe something else we're doing that we weren't before, where we put people on medications when they're in the hospital to thin their blood uh, to help prevent a blood clot. But we're not recommending everyone take aspirin at home right. because that could cause those sorts of issues too. Right. So we'll just put that there too. Um, th there's uh, Dave, if you wouldn't mind speaking to, it says, what percentage of tests are false positives or false negatives? Just a quick answer for us on that one, if you would. I would say false positives are relatively rare in most settings. I would say when you're doing some of the testing in like nursing homes and stuff, false positives can be a problem because there's very low numbers of true positives in that setting. But most of the time, if you're getting a positive, if you've got symptoms and you get a test that's positive, you are definitely positive and, and you can have be pretty certain of that. Um, the false negative um, is sometimes an issue, especially if you're testing earlier in the course of the illness um, where there's not very many virus particles around and they're not producing very many protein yet if you're using an antigen test. And so the false, false negative can be an actual thing early on. Um, and so sometimes we will retest individuals after a couple of days, especially, you know, a classic example of that is if you have true loss of sense of taste and smell, this is another one of those bizarre things about COVID of how it causes that and almost nothing else causes that symptom. And, and time and time again, if we have somebody that has that symptom, if they test negative, we say you need to stay isolated and we test them again in two or three days and they almost invariably turn positive after that. Uh, say, Clarissa, this first email asks, how can we increase the number of family members allowed to visit someone in the ICU for COVID? Do you see that happening? Ooh. Why not? I mean, with the current environment, probably not. I mean, there are exceptions that are made sometimes when you know we've reached the point where we don't think that you're going to survive you know, COVID, when we're talking about sort of end of life care uh, and comfort care, then there are things that we can do to sort of allow family in some way. Um, we do a lot of video visits for people where we put, you know, the nurses will hold the screen for people who are very ill so they can visit with their families. Um, but I, I don't see with the current rate of increase so based on that graph of letting a lot of people in the ICU to visit COVID patients at this point. Because we'd be putting them, them at, at risk yeah. and we would be putting more staff at risk because some of them 
could transmit the virus without us knowing it too. It's it's such a hard situation. It's, yeah, the the emotional aspects of COVID are one of the things that hit me and the rest of the people working in the hospital the hardest. Tell me about that. How do you how is this pan pandemic impacting you and the doctors and the nurses and the staff around you? Oh, you know, <laughs> physicians in general, like we we train for emergencies. You know, we train for things when they're hard and when we you know someone's very sick and you run in and you do all those things, but it the idea of those sort of high stress times it should be you know they should be temporary you know you do that and then you sort of decompress and at this point it's been high stress for weeks there really is no decompressing because it's like everything every day you come in things are just worse than the day before so even if you know for as a hospitalist like i get days where i'm not at work and i'm like okay that's great but i know that when i come back things are going to be worse than when i left and we all feel that. I think there's a lot of leaning on each other um, because we're all in the same sort of COVID boat together, unfortunately. Um, but it's it's stressful <laughs> right now, yeah. for sure. Yeah, which is why we really want to wear get, your mask. Uh, <laughs> get 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 a hold of this thing. Uh, this person asks, quick, Dave, are there any long haul COVID specialists in the Brookings Sioux Falls area? You know, I suppose I could see that happening. Some COVID specialists, but you know, maybe some people are doing more than others. Uh, but uh, we don't have anyone really dedicated to COVID patients as an outpatient or anything, no, do we? I, I don't think so. And we're, you know, frankly, there's so many cases right now that everybody's having to pitch in and, and see yeah. their fair share right now. And so I think uh, pretty much all of our, certainly our primary care clinicians are getting pretty comfortable and have seen enough cases that uh, we're getting all getting a lot more experience than we wanted with COVID. And so you're in pretty good hands most anywhere right now. Yeah. Let's talk about some hopeful things like vaccinations. Uh, when do you think they'll be available in our area? Um, and uh, tell us a bit about what we're seeing with vaccinations. So we're starting to hear a little bit more about uh, the vaccines that are out there some of the earlier ones that i think you read about are like the pfizer pfizer and the moderna vaccine and both of those vaccines at some point in the next month or so they're going to probably reach some of their first it was called interim milestones where they're uh, going to look at how many hospitalizations they've had in the placebo group and in the treatment group and compare those and so if those, if they show a big difference that almost all of the hospitalizations say happened in the placebo group and very few happened in the group that actually got the vaccine, then that's gonna be pretty good evidence that these vaccines work. And then at the same time, then they'll have enough cases that they can look at safety. Were there any unanticipated adverse effects that uh, we didn't realize? And so, you know, if everything went absolutely, absolutely perfectly, you know, we might see a few doses of vaccine starting to show up, say, for frontline healthcare workers uh, by the end of the year, early into next year, and then start, you know, next uh, spring be able to start seeing doses come into the general public. Uh, but there, that's if everything goes exactly right. We can have yeah. lots of setbacks here where if when they look at those vaccines and open it up, then the difference between the two groups isn't as big as we'd hoped for. Then they're going to have to run those, those uh, trials longer or we're going to have to wait for the third or fourth vaccine to see if it's more effective. And so best case scenario, we'll start seeing some vaccine yet uh, around the first of the year or even uh, a little bit earlier into December, but that's if everything went perfect and the doses will be relatively few uh, for a while at, at even at that level. And so, so best case scenario for the general public, I think would be, I don't know, February, March range. Sure, and so here's a question. A, a, a caller got Guillain-Barre syndrome from the flu shot last year. Do you think they'll be able to get a COVID vaccine when it's available? That's a good question, and that's one of the one of the questions that we're going to have to answer when we look at that safety data. And, and Guillain-Barre, yeah. uh, which is um, uh, a nerve uh, swelling that uh, causes you to have weakness and potentially numbness uh, from, like, in your legs and your arms, and that is something that we're going to be watching very closely. On does this virus tend to cause that? at all and if so how often you know do you recommend one, a, one and do you a recommend a, a flu shot if someone's had covid just briefly 
Well, I recommend a flu shot to everybody every year, so absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. Um, some final thoughts, uh, Clarissa. What would you share with, with, with our viewers out there uh, about what you're seeing and what you what you want to convey to everyone? I, you know, I, I really just want people to understand that, you know, it's the work. Right now, things are, are getting not, we're not in a good place in South Dakota, you know, and every person who's watching has it within their power to do something to help. So even if you don't work in a hospital or you don't work in healthcare, by you wearing your mask, you are helping to help, help us sort of stem the tide of COVID. Uh, and I really would encourage everyone to do that. Good hand hygiene, flu shot. I mean, do your part because at this point, it's gonna take all of us uh, to get this under control. Yeah, you know, I think about when March came around and, and, and everyone, you know, was really careful. Yeah. Um, we weren't having COVID around here. We, yeah. I mean, we started having a couple cases, Yeah. but uh, th we did have plenty of influenza going around. And I had plenty of people that were really sick. They came in really sick, worried that they had COVID and they had influenza. But as you see the, the, the graphs of influenza and it just plummeted, it just plummeted once people were careful. Yeah. And so we just need people to be more careful. It doesn't mean we need to shut down the economy and it doesn't mean we need to uh, uh, you know, cancel everything. But, but be, be mindful of what we're doing. And, and so when people are getting together for the holidays pretty soon, Dave, for Thanksgiving, what can they do to help? You know, some people are asking to do opening the windows or adjusting the temperature inside your car help, or what can they do at home to help decrease the risk? You can do some things to decrease the risk, um, but you really can't eliminate it. And if we're talking family gatherings here, there's usually that means that there's the older generation at that family gathering, and they're the ones that are that are really at risk for uh, potential complications. I can think of one family that I know of that uh, uh, the uh, grandmother had her 80th birthday, and and a lot of grandkids and kids came over. And she got COVID within the next week after that and died. And so that's the same sort of situation that we're really worried about going into Thanksgiving with these family gatherings. And so I can tell you for our family gathering this year, it's gonna be a, a virtual for pretty much the first time in my adult life. We're not gonna to go to either my wife's family or my family for Thanksgiving, just because you know both both uh, grandparents are in their, their 80s and the risk is just too high yeah. in our opinion. Dave, so. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You know, I think it's a good point that this is going to give us an opportunity to be creative in our family <laughs> gatherings. You know, we were creative at, some of us were creative in Halloween and made it a memorable experience for our kids. Rather than dwelling on what we can't do, let's, let's try to see what my, new memories can we make My kids think this is up. the best Halloween yeah. they've ever had. There and we go. didn't go trick or treating. Yeah. We had a haunted house and a scavenger hunt around the yard and they thought yeah. that was amazing. Yeah, so <laughs> if we can spin yeah. this and come up with new fun traditions, yeah. that that'll, might help. And now for tonight's uh, Prairie Quiz question, the answer, testing is usually necessary to tell the difference between influenza and COVID-19, true or false? The answer is true. Testing is usually necessary to tell the difference between influenza and COVID-19. There's a lot of overlap between the symptoms of the two diseases, but it's important to distinguish which one you have because their treatments can be different. And the winner of tonight's quiz is Mary Ann Bradner from Dell Rapids. Thank you, Mary Ann, for participating. A book will be in the mail soon. We'll be right back after this. Have you heard? The Prairie Doc has a podcast. Listen to Prairie Doc Radio and On Call with the Prairie Doc wherever you get your podcasts. These programs feature physicians and other health professionals discussing various medical topics important to you and your family. Look for Prairie Doc on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. The Prairie Doc Podcast. Stay healthy out there, people. My son is a Cub Scout, and I am a den leader. Recently, our den met outside and practiced putting up tents and learned how to build a fire. With efforts to stay distance, every scout made his own s'more, and we had such a fun time. One highlight of the evening was letting each scout try to light the fire. We went through a series of mistakes with the matches, and thankfully no one got hurt. 
They were so proud to learn how to light a match and start a fire. However, it was also daunting for them. One scout specifically commented on how excited he was and how scared he was. I tried to teach safe techniques and explained how you do not need to fear fire, but you need to respect it. Approaching something with respect rather than fear is helpful in so many things in life. Whether it be a wild animal, fire, or a weapon, cautious respect is usually more helpful than fear. Education and experience, without losing that caution and respect, may be life-saving. Those principles could be helpful as we cope with COVID-19. Depending on your situation, you may not be afraid, or you could be overcome with fear. On the one hand, fear could paralyze us and cripple our response. On the other hand, a complete disregard for measures to help decrease the spread of the virus is like being careless with fire. We all want to return to a normalcy and a way of life that is healthy physically, mentally, socially, and economically. However, cases are on the rise, and denial of reality and a disregard for others is fuel for the fire. The efforts of so many people to decrease the spread, such as social distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, and being careful is helping to give scientists more time to research treatments and vaccinations. Progress is being made, and so many people are united in the same goal of getting through this pandemic safely together. Recently, I was visiting with a 98-year-old man. I asked him about this pandemic and what he experienced in the Great Depression and World War II. He was confident we would get through this. We will succeed if we do not let ourselves become divided, but work together treating the virus with caution and supporting those around us. A big thank you tonight to our guests, Dr. Clarissa Barnes and Dr. David Bassel for volunteering their time to help us learn more about COVID-19. That does it for tonight. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. I think we... You find yourself confused or forgetting why you went into another room, normal life experience, or the beginning of dementia. Is it my memory? Next time, on call with the Prairie Doc. Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Dean. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Healing Words Foundation, and I'd like to take a minute to ask for your help. I grew up on a farm west of Wessington Springs. After high school, I left the area and pursued medical education in New York, Seattle, and I even spent a year in England. When we completed our education, my wife, Kathy, a nurse midwife, and I returned to Wessington Springs where we have lived and practiced for more than 40 years. Just like you, we love our hometown. For many years, I've been a, an advocate for small communities and for good access to healthcare in rural communities. Prairie Doc programs play a uniquely important role in helping rural populations maintain easy access to up-to-date healthcare knowledge. Rick and Joni Holm started this mission of providing healthcare information free of charge to all of us especially to those who have limited access to healthcare professionals. Now it's up to us to help our four Prairie Docs and many others continue the legacy. I would urge you, as Kathy and I have done, to contribute to the Healing Words Foundation. Go to prairiedoc.org and make your contribution today. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting.
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Fishback Financial Corporation, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swift Tell Communications.